Welcome to the Alan Elkan Interviews, an unprecedented window into the minds of some of the most well-known and respected figures of the last 25 years. Saad Mosseini, where is your base at the moment? My base is Dubai. You are born in London. You, yes. You were in Japan and then you go to Australia. And then afterwards, you went back to Afghanistan. And uh, after the Russian occupation, when the Taliban went away, you launched your uh, company, the beginning of Moby Group, with your brothers, with your siblings in Kabul, right? In Afghanistan, from 2002. That's correct. You created various things. You had Tolo. TV first, and then Tolo News in 2004, right? Which became one of the most important uh, TV channels in Afghanistan, right? Yes, I mean, the news network was always smaller than the entertainment network, but yeah, but it was important in terms of people accessing news. So we had three television networks and two radio networks in Afghanistan. So how many years you lived in Afghanistan since 2002? For how many years? Well, up until uh, last August, I mean, you know, I was there every couple of weeks. Around 20 years, right? Right, 20 years. I mean, half of that was full-time in Afghanistan. And then the last 10 years, as we were expanding the business internationally, I would go back every couple of weeks, sometimes every week. When you say you expand, is that you you went in uh, Iraq, you went in Iran, you went in... uh, Pakistan, uh, Ethiopia... And um, how was it and how is it to operate in countries which for a reason or another are um, somehow in a kind of war? I mean, the worst obviously is Afghanistan, but then the other countries are not very tranquil either. How is it to work in these conditions? Well, we've become specialists in difficult markets. We have a great deal of patience and we have capacity for a great amount of pain and difficulty and we persist. They're not easy, but at the same time, because they're difficult, we also see these markets as uh, you know, providing us with the opportunity to establish something interesting, a viable yeah, business. When you say difficult, obviously it's difficult because of the political situation by the more or less war going and coming. With what kind of difficulties you have? So firstly, it's uh, quite often the regulatory environment you have to navigate. Most of these countries, for example, Ethiopia, it was to convince the authorities that the channel would not undermine their government or their way of life. And then the the second challenge is, of course, to hire the right people. There's usually capacities lacking. People don't have the expertise to produce programs. You know, people are very talented, but you have to invest in that talent. You have to teach them how to dub, how to teach, teach them how to produce. Last but not least, it's the economic environment. You have to convince people to advertise because sustainability of a business is very important. So I think uh, along the way, you will, you will see a lot of challenges. And of course, as you start to do more and more programs, you're bound to step on toes because some people will see the programs as culturally not appropriate and other times they will see them as politically not appropriate. Uh, You're always navigating these difficult environments. And of course, you know, your job is to be a student, to be nimble and to A, convince the regulators and even members of the public because sometimes you can have protests outside your building because they're not happy with what you've transmitted. For instance, Iran is... uh controlled by a very religious government. It's a country that has financed part of wars. They have very much difficulties with America and other Western countries. How do you deal with that? I mean, I know that you have a TV in Parsi, in in, in the language, and, and how do you deal with that? Is it difficult to deal with the politicians and not to be suspected and... How do you work? Well, Iran was a bit different because in Iran, what we did was we we launched a channel for the Farsi speakers of the region, including Iran. And we were transmitting via satellite into Iran. We had no physical presence in Iran at all. We're actually doing it from Dubai. And it was hugely controversial because it was popular. So when we launched 
in uh, 2008 or 2009, essentially the whole country was watching these telenovelas dubbed into Farsi. There were no political programs, only entertainment programs, but the regime was very suspicious and they were very aggressive. They attempted to interfere with our satellite signal. They arrested some of our employees who went to Iran on holidays. I mean, obviously that network stopped transmissions six years ago, but still, while it was transmitting, it was hugely controversial, but it was also very popular. And what about uh, Iraq? Unfortunately for us, uh, we launched Iraq as ISIS was about to capture Mosul. So it was one of our few big failures because we had to shut it down soon after. But Iraq was actually not that difficult in terms of launching. It wasn't that difficult in terms of training people. Just the political environment changed very, very quickly as Mosul fell. And, you know, as, you know, we're business people, so we're very nimble and very quick. And we decided to cut our losses and shut down. So if I understand well, you shut down Iran and Iraq now. Don't have them we've, anymore. No, we shut down Iran and Iraq and we sold Pakistan. We sold Ethiopia. We sold our Middle East joint venture to Vice. We've actually been, over the last five or six years, we've exited many of our media positions simply because the media market has become very unpredictable. And what about uh, Afghanistan? I mean, since the, the Taliban's came back and they run the country and they cut, uh, you know, most of the activities uh, or the freedoms of women, you have a network with men, women, journalists. Uh, how do you cope with them? Well, with great difficulty. I mean, it's ironic that, you know, as business people, you tend, as entrepreneurs, you have the freedom to open a business and you also have the freedom to close a business. But in Afghanistan, almost in some ways, we don't have that freedom. We have this moral obligation to continue and we have continued. We have 500 employees still inside of Afghanistan working in a very, very difficult environment. Only two weeks ago, three of our people were arrested by the Taliban, two held overnight at the intelligence agency. And almost since they came into power, we have problems with them on a weekly basis. And a lot of our entertainment programs, we've had to tone down. We've stopped transmitting music, some of the risque soap operas and telenovelas we've had to stop. But the one thing we've continued, same as before, is our news transmissions. We are continuing to put out. And are they interfering with that? Can you have women journalists over there? So in August 2021, we had eight or nine women working for our news operations. Today, we have 22. So we have actually hired more women since the arrival of the Taliban. And And how is this possible? Well, they're in front of the camera, they're behind the camera, they're producing, they're journalists. It's difficult, but it's possible. I mean, unless they put an outright ban. I mean, sometimes they go to interview ministers and the ministers refuse to meet with them. Uh, But nonetheless, we have persisted. I think it's an important step for us. And it's a, you know, we're trying to signal that women are very important for us as journalists. And, you know, the Taliban come to our TV station and discuss political issues of the day with these female journalists. And that continues. It sort of defies what you hear, but it's happening today as we speak. Now, whether we can continue... You are in Dubai, okay? And you closed many of your operations, as you said before, right? You sold many of your operations. And it looks like that Afghanistan is not exactly secure. I mean, it's still open, but it could close any time or they could bother you a lot. So what do you do as a businessman? I mean, business is not going very well. I mean, you were called the murder of uh, Asia somehow, but uh, if you close all your operations, how do you invest your money? What do you do? Well, I mean, the other businesses were purely commercial reasons. We had offers to sell the businesses, which we did, and where you know we, we you take your profits where you can. So we strategically, just in terms of the media, and whether it's Lee or whether it's in in the Middle East, in terms of the you know the arrival of platforms like Netflix and others, it's made the entire media sector very let's put it this way uh, unpredictable. So I think we are, are a strategic decision to start to exit our positions is probably not that different to a lot of other big media companies, which have done the same thing. In Afghanistan, it's a little different because it's firstly, it's our home country. And there was always a sense of duty to remain engaged. 
And at the moment, we're struggling. I mean, it's a, from a commercial perspective, the businesses are struggling and we're burning cash in a business that was always profitable. Our Afghan business was always profitable. But we made a commitment in September of last year to continue for as long as we could for two reasons. I think, firstly, you know, Afghanistan is a very changed country to what the world saw in 2000. So after the Taliban in 2001, the country, every metric you look at has improved. Literacy rates have gone up dramatically. Life expectancy has improved dramatically. People have become urbanized. It's still a very, very young population. The average age of an Afghan is 18, and 60% of the population is under 21. So in a lot of ways, we're not losing hope in the younger generation of Afghans, no matter who's in charge, even if it's the Taliban. Because in a lot of ways, the Taliban and their regime and their ideology doesn't reflect what the average Afghan feels. And a lot of ways, what do you media. Think that the Taliban will have to somehow, comp- if they want to keep power, they have to comp- control the country. They will have to compromise with some of the changes. They will have to be different from what they were before. Or they Absolutely. Will, uh, make the country go back to the medieval state in a few years. You know, realistically, I don't think they can survive because you can't starve people to death, deprive them of robust and bustling economy. You can't deprive them of their rights, especially if you're a woman or a minority. You can't deprive the younger people of their education. You can't deprive them of hope and expect to remain in power because in three months or six months or eight months or nine months, people are going to say enough's enough. And we've seen this before. So I think there would be wise to adopt a more inclusive approach and to open up, open the country up, to allow free movement of people, to allow for education of women, to allow for rights of minorities. Because this younger population, I mean, they're just watching right now, not knowing quite what to do, but that's not going to be the same in six months' time. Do they feel betrayed in Afghanistan by the way the United States removed the people and the army so quickly? I mean, was it a big shock? I think so. I think people feel betrayed by the previous government, which was seen as corrupt and inept, and also betrayed by the United States. It's not a question of whether the Americans want, you know, should leave or shouldn't leave. It's just the way they left. And I yeah. think this has been a difficult thing for them to accept. It's just the way the Americans left so abruptly without putting plans in place to ensure that the generation that they had invested in, which is a younger generation of Afghans, that their interests were taken into account. As a matter of fact, it was made very quickly in April for them to leave by the end of August. So so, so they they effectively gave the Afghans a four-month window. In this very somehow unexpected situation uh, between Russia and Ukraine and the fact that the whole world is watching at that horrible invasion and war, what do you think? How is your media dealing with that? And what is your personal view? Well, you know, we suffered uh, in the hands of the Soviets. You know, we've had family members who were lost in the 1980s. We understand in a lot of ways the brutality that today the Ukrainians are facing. Uh, If you look at Afghanistan, a million individuals were killed, another million handicapped, seven million forced to flee Afghanistan. And what transpired in the 1980s, thanks to the Soviets, Afghanistan is continuing to pay a price for. So we understand their pain well. How many Afghan people live in exile and how many are still in the country? We have 40 million Afghans living inside the country. 40 million. So Um, you have as many people as they have in Ukraine? Today we do, yes. But like most countries hit by conflict, we have a very high birth rate. As a matter of fact, I think our, po- our population is growing at 3% per annum, which, which is one of the highest in the world. But we still, we, although there were 7 million refugees, a lot of them did return. But I think even today, if you look at the number of people uh, residing outside, it's about 4 or 5 million people, mostly in Iran and Pakistan. And some of those people will never come back. And the population is mainly Muslim, right? Yeah, Afghanistan is perhaps 99% Muslim. Our minorities, we had Hindus, uh, many of whom have left over the last two decades. And you, you are Muslim, and you are Muslim yourself, your family, right? Yes, correct. So you have less problems to deal with other countries in the region. 
Yeah, but I think, you know, the, the entire region is Muslim. So uh, Islam is not the issue. It's a form of Islam that some people are advocating, which is an issue. And mm-hmm. I think this is also the conundrum inside of Afghanistan in terms of what the Taliban are advocating is perhaps not the sort of Islam that the generation of my father grew up with. It's a far more radicalized Islam that became prevalent during the Soviet occupation, madrasas and, and, and religious schools funded by the Saudis and promoted by the Pakistanis, with, of course, the acquiescence of the Americans and the Westerners, is something that today the region has to contend with. You were talking about the way you watch the, this uh, war in uh, Ukraine, saying that you, you had yourself a terrible experience, not personally, but not only personally with your family, but I mean the whole country has memory of a very bad very tragic experience in the late 80s, 1980s, right? And so you more or less know what's going on there. Yeah, this is scorched earth policy is very familiar. I mean, the, the Soviets used to throw down toys, what looked like toys, but they were actually mines. And the intention was to traumatize families and to maim and handicap their children. So the ruthlessness we're witnessing today in the Ukraine is all too familiar to most Afghans who experienced what the Soviets did in the 1980s. And do you think that the situation in Ukraine, between Russia and Ukraine, is going to last as long as it lasted in Afghanistan? Or what is your view of what kind of issue there will be in this conflict? Well, I mean, the last time the, the Soviets pulled out of Afghanistan in 1989, after almost 10 years, And that was the beginning of the end of the Soviet empire. I, and I think Soviet Russian leaders will bear that in mind that anything short of victory will not bode well for them or their government down the track. So I'm not sure how Putin can conclude this war quickly unless he can declare victory. And he hasn't been victorious, or at least not yet. So I, I don't know. I just It pains me to say this, but I think this war could continue for a while long. And I hope I'm wrong. Mm-hmm international journalists and medias talk a lot about the fact that uh, there are basically there are three empires, America, China, and Russia. And plus you have countries like India that could be a real block against block. But in this discussion, the Middle East is not very much involved, and not even Africa, right? They, they're not taken into... The consideration is this geopolitical map. What do you think is going to be happening instead in the Middle East and in Africa? Well, I think what uh, Alain, you, you will observe is that the majority of the citizens of this globe have not bought into the Western narrative on the Ukraine. You know, if you look at Africa, if you look at South America, if you look at most of Asia, people are not exactly on board. They may criticize what the Russians are doing, but they're not necessarily pro the West with the Ukraine. And I think it has a lot to do with the behavior of America over the last 25 years or 30 years, including Iraq and so forth. People see the hypocrisy of it all. So I think ultimately people will side with the West on this issue, but it's going to take time. And I think how could the Americans talk about war crimes and Putin when they decided a few years back not to join the international court, you know, not to be a member of it. So I think people see the hypocrisy in it all and the contradictions. And someone pointed out to me that just in the first two weeks of the Iraq war, something like 7,000 civilians were killed in Iraq. So people say, yes, what the Russians are doing are horrendous and horrific. But the West has done things which are not that dissimilar only 15, 20 years ago. So I think that the West, you know, needs to do a lot more in terms of its outreach to convince, you know, other citizens, you know, outside the Western hemisphere to buy into their narrative. And I think that this is really, really important. But if the West, uh, not in a few months, but in a few years, will be able to be, let's say, self-sufficient with alternative energies, which without oil and without gas, that's going to be a big problem for Asia and um, the Middle East, or Middle East and Asia, you think, are prepared as well to alternative things and therefore will be as competitive as they are now. Because now the Western world is bending its knees in front of countries who have oil 
instead to find an alternative to Russia. But this is probably temporary because the alternative energies, including the atomic energy, are becoming a strong reality and more and more an absolute necessity, right? Yeah, I mean, I think the access to energy or having massive resources are more of a curse than a... I mean, I'm sure that it helps build infrastructure and then keep some people happy. But ultimately, I think the world is better off finding alternative um, sources of energy, whether it's nuclear or solar or whatever, or wind. And it's inevitable. But the question is, how soon? I think that even today, when you look at Europe and its addiction to Russian oil and gas, you know, some tough decisions need to be made. But I think longer term, I think it's in the interest of this region to not be cursed with, you know, sitting on so much oil and gas. I think longer term, it's in their interest. Because I think that's when you need to focus on running your economy in a more responsible manner. I mean, today, many of these countries, uh, I think the UAE where I live is a bit different. You know, they obviously have invested heavily in other things, including tourism and and creating a sort of a Singapore business hub in Dubai and so forth. But a lot of other countries are not prepared. But I think that this pulling off this need for Middle Eastern energy longer term is in the interest of the people, in, in the interest of all people, on your side as well as our side. People assume that because of what's happening, Russia will be more and more dependent in a way from China. And maybe one day it will be like a long hand of China, if it's not yet. And obviously the relationship China-America rather complicated because it's a race to who will be the most powerful. And then there is the Taiwan issue in the middle. And in the other hand, a country that has been even more ambiguous than China in this event, in this war, it's India. The position of India somehow was not predicted. Yeah, I mean, it's a surprise because, you know, India for so long was seen as a sort of a non-aligned nation, had a lot of credibility with the developing world. But India has lost that mantle to an extent, partially because I think the, the, this regime is so belligerently nationalistic, uh, but also I think partially because of these sorts of decisions. And although India relies on Russia a lot less than it used to, but it still buys a lot of weapons from the Russians. But the more the Russians continue in terms of their atrocities and it it comes to light, I think there's going to be more pressure on the Indians to distance themselves from the Russians. But I think President Biden is due to speak to Modi in the coming days. And I think the pressure from the U.S. side will also increase because it's you're either with us or against us, to use that line from uh, George W. Bush. But, you know, you can't be half pregnant uh, when you're seeing mm-hmm. what we're seeing today in Ukraine. Leaders have to make decisions and you cannot be half pregnant on these sorts of issues. But China is a quarter pregnant. I mean, in the sense that they are not with the Americans, but they are not really with the Russians, right? Even recently, they voted with America at the United Nations on the... Um, human rights, what was it? Uh, the, I mean, and the Indians didn't. It looks like if the Indians were even more against than the Chinese. Yeah, I mean, well, I think, you know, the interesting thing is that people want to be on the side of winners. And Putin failed to win quickly. And I think that it's natural for people to say, hey, we don't want to back a loser. And I think that that reluctance, perhaps from the Chinese today, is a reflection of Putin's inability to prevail. You know, the whole, you know, the narrative was that they were, he's going to go and capture Kiev in two days and he will install his own puppet and then the West will be forced to face, you know, to deal with an affaire complete. But now it's it not the case. Work. No. It didn't work. So now the Chinese have to reassess and to say, well, hold on, longer term, this is not in our interest to be backing a loser. And as Putin corners himself, he's making more and more mistakes. And so for that reason, I think you're just seeing that the initial show of support, which seemed absolute, is now, like you said, a quarter pregnant. So I think the Chinese will have to think through their longer term relationship with the Russians on this particular issue of Ukraine. Ukraine failure and all that is probably going to make them think about the relationship with Taiwan, right? Yeah, well, I think that... It would be less easy to invade Taiwan, at least with soldiers like that. 
Yeah, and I think NATO has shown resolve in terms of you know supporting the Ukrainians, at least with weapons and other forms of assistance. But on Taiwan, the Americans have made it very clear that they would actually step in and support the Taiwanese. And, and, you know, and a very well-known general said to me, if there's conflict between the Chinese and the Americans, the Americans will hit the Chinese very hard. And you have to understand you are dealing with a nation of... You know, the the one child policy means that most families only have one child. So if you kill 40,000 Chinese soldiers, which the Americans could in a very short space of time, you're depriving 40,000 families of heirs. And the impact will be so much more dramatic. And for the Chinese, from a public perception point of view, it's going to be a very, very difficult one to argue in terms of you know, convincing their public to continue with the war. So the impact could be dramatic. And China's a different country to what it was a couple hundred years ago. I mean, in some ways, it's a spoiled country. Every family's got one child. They've had a relatively easy middle-class existence. They haven't fought a war since the 1960s, which they lost, by the way. Getting into conflict with the U.S. will have consequences. Yeah, but the Chinese are completely in the hands of the, of the party, right? So. If the party doesn't implode, the party is controlling everything, right? Including the media. I don't think you could have free media in China. No, but I think people will get access to information, even with the fake news and the propaganda. I think people will ultimately... And do you think that Russians have access to information? Because they say (laughs) that Russians are supporting Putin in a very, very large majority, right? Something like more than 80% of the Russians are with Putin. And but that's huge. Because usual, they believe in the news. What do you think about that? Well, that's, I think that's an initial reaction to any sort of war. You rally behind your leader and your troops and you support them. But it's only been going for a couple of months. I mean, they haven't really felt the pain. It's a bit like when you get injured, you know, you don't feel the pain initially. Your body's so, the adrenaline is popping, you're still feeling warm, you're, you're not feeling the pain. That pain will come in time. The economic sanctions will really hit hard in the months to come. They haven't been hit with these sanctions, but when, they, when they're when they unable to travel outside, when they're unable to buy certain goods, when inflation shoots up dramatically, when they have people who have lost kids in the war, you know, Russian casualties are now somewhere between 15 and 20,000 men. That's, on paper at least, that's more men than they lost in Afghanistan in 10 years of fighting. What about Europe? What is your judgment about the UK and Europe? You think Europe is going to be stronger after this or not? I know that it depends also a lot on the French elections, but what is your feeling about Europe and about the UK after Brexit? I think there has to be almost a new Europe. I think that they have to move beyond the EU and perhaps give the Brits the opportunity to come back in. You call it something new because I think this is a new opportunity, both for the EU or whatever form it shape it takes, and NATO as well. Some people have to come back in, like the Brits, and some people have to be forced out, like the Hungarians. They just went out, the Brits. So- yes, And they're very proud of being independent and all that. So how is this possible? But they're feeling the pain. I mean, I think the the British economy has suffered. You know, you go to any restaurant, they don't have employees. It certainly hasn't had an impact. They've had, uh, you know, supply chains are being interrupted. You're not finding enough employees. It's had a real impact on the economy, in particular if you're in London. But I think that there is this need now for coming together. And I think there's an opportunity. So... Maybe there's a new Europe that can emerge from the ashes of the EU with all its issues and problems that, you know, and requires a vision. And I think that's why, you know, leadership is going to be so important for the Europeans as to who's going to take the lead role on trying to redefine what this new Europe is going to look like. And the fact is, I don't know if you agree, is that leaders are very weak at the moment. I mean, there are not many great figures of politicians in the world. And um, there is no Bismarck, there is no Metternich, there is no Cavour, there is no even Churchill. I mean, there are no people like this. And to unite Europe or to make something major, you really need big leaders. You're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. I mean, Macron, who you know has sort of 
in a lot of ways tried to you know talk about his vision for Europe. I mean, he's vulnerable, and uh, although he's expected to win, there's some doubts as to whether he can prevail. But yes, you're absolutely right, and there is no Merkel. And Boris Johnson, although he's shown leadership on the Ukrainian issue, generally he's not seen as a strong leader. Many so, times, all these people who are working on foreign politics, which are obviously very important, alliances and defense and all that, we can see Biden, we can say Macron, we can say Johnson. Germany also has changed its politics. You know, we would never thought of a, a new army, so much money into the army in Germany. But local people don't care much about it. I mean, th- this large vote, for instance, to Madame Le Pen in this recent election, even if she doesn't make it at the end, and what happened in Hungary and other countries shows that simple people, the majority of people, don't care so much about international. I mean, uh, Churchill was not elected after the war. People look at their money. I think inflation or economy, the cost of petrol is much more important to the Americans or to the Europeans than the help to the Ukraine. You're I mean, actually right. I know it's horrible to say because it sounds not very glorious and there are not many ideals in this. And the politics are reduced to sheer, you know, economical survival. But nevertheless, people vote very much like that. Yeah, no, you're right. All politics is local, as they say. But then again, the war will impact price of fuel. The war will impact the number of refugees that you'll see in your cities. And the war will impact other things, which then the locals care about. You know, when I talk about Afghanistan, I always say what happens in Afghanistan doesn't stay in Afghanistan. Because if you look at the number of refugees, which are refugees into Europe, with the exception of this year, every year the Afghans are in the top two. And continued conflict, whether it's in the Ukraine or Afghanistan, you will see a lot more refugees. And I know there's a great deal of goodwill when it comes to Ukrainian refugees, but that's going to last about 25 seconds. You that's know, right. You need, so then you know, people it's not, will say, why should we give a job to them when my son has not a job? And yeah, then in right. France, the population is less and less French. There's a lot of discontent and uneasiness in all that. Sometimes it's common to hear, especially a left-leaning politician, to be dismissive of people's concerns. But these concerns are real. And I think it's not just about jobs. It's also about identity. It's, you know, if we are French, what happens once our culture is fully diluted? I mean, and I think politicians, by not acting in a more responsible way, and I think, you know, Obama in particular made a lot of mistakes in terms of not addressing people's concerns, which allowed for someone like Trump to emerge. And I think that you will continue to see right-wing politicians emerge because people's concerns are very genuine, and particularly outside the major cities. And I think that that's why I think the Ukrainian issue, and even in Afghanistan, I think these issues, these conflicts impact domestic issues in Europe and other parts of the world, as you start to see more and more refugees come into your countries. So in one way, there's a necessity of union in order to create defense or a stronger economy or whatever. On the other hand, each nation is defending its identity and is afraid to lose it, if I understand. In a way, the Ukrainians are defending freedom and democracy vis-a-vis the Russian imperialism, which is symbolically very strong. But on the other hand, the very nationalistic. I mean, each country defends its identity. It doesn't want to lose it. And who are we to say that they're wrong? Because Yeah, but they're not know, strong enough. Yeah. You know, I think the issue of identity in the 21st century, as we've seen, and you know, not just in, the, in, in Europe and the US, but also in Asia, as well as Africa, you know, it's going to be the defining thing for many of these politicians, that this is a platform that sort of is whether it's for Orban or for Modi or for others, it's a formula for success. I think politicians are going to continue to ride this issue as for as long as they can, and because it resonates with local voters. You talked about the fact that you are a businessman and that uh, the world of media, independently from the political issues, you know, like, like the Taliban's or like in Iran, the media everywhere are completely changing and uh, media business in what sense we all know that newspapers 
are less read and all that. But uh, still, there are platforms, there are many social medias and so on and so forth. I think what we're seeing now is a fragmented market. People feel comfortable going into their own sort of bubbles and having their views reinforced. You know, and I think one of the interesting things is that, you know, you talk about intellectual humility, the ability or the capacity to listen to the other side is disappearing very quickly. People want to go to their own echo chambers and want their own views reinforced by others. You know, and it's interesting that the intolerance that you're seeing, whether it's in the U.S. because of Fox News or in the Middle East or other places, it's more obvious now than ever before. People are unable to listen to the other side. And there's a great deal of anger. And I think the fragmentation of the media has played a role. And of course, when I say fragmentation is that you don't have to have a network. You could just be on Facebook and have 50 people follow you and you're able to have create your own echo chamber. And I think this sort of fragmented market is going to become more and more difficult to manage. And it's obviously the big, big players like, you know, the likes of Netflix and others with billions of dollars that they produce content, they are monopolizing viewers on one hand. And then, of course, the social media platforms are also monopolizing viewers. In, but what is the kid- future of a publisher like you? Well, I think that we still produce a lot of content. We're agnostic when it comes to which platform we use. We put things on YouTube. We put shorter versions on, net, on Facebook and on uh, Instagram. But we also continue to have our, you know, things like our over-the-top platforms, like a Netflix type, and we're on satellite, and we're on terrestrial. So for now, we're present everywhere. And we're producing a lot of content. And we still produce about, you know, I don't know, five or 6,000 hours of content annually, which is a pretty substantial amount of content. And we also dub or, or adapt about three or 4,000 hours it's a substantial amount of content. But the one thing wh- which I think is continuing to remain interesting, the two things, is news and sports. And I think this, still you can generate mass viewership for these sorts of things, but I'm not sure for how long in terms of news because a lot of people are not even watching the news networks anymore. They're getting their news on, you know, through their friends on Facebook. So it's a very uncertain media market we're facing um, it's definitely changing. In some countries, it's changed quickly. In some other countries, it's changing slowly, but change is definitely coming. Even in a country like Japan, where they read millions of newspapers? Or... Yeah, but I'm not sure if Japan is the right model. It's got an aging population. Its population is going to shrink by a third in the next two to three decades. And, you know, the average age of a Japanese is, I think, one of the oldest populations in the world. But so they, 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 the Afghanistan, which is one of the youngest, right? That's right. Young, youngest country outside of sub-Saharan Africa, median age of 18. In Japan, where I grew up, it's funny because I went back a couple of years ago, even taxis have not changed. You go to a ramen or noodle shop, the vending machines they use have not changed since the 1980s. But Japan is going to be a lot slower in terms of adopting new technologies and new ways. The message you give is that maybe the Western world should pay more attention to what happens in the rest of the world. In order to win them over, because ultimately that's what they need to do. Thank you very much for this interesting interview. We wish you all good. Thank you, Alan. Alan Elkan Interviews.